Hey guys, welcome back. TJ here with Dead History for today, part two of our Benjamin Harrison series here. And I'm here with my good old friend, Henry. Henry. What's up, dude? How are you? I'm good. You're good? All right. We're here for part two, right? Mm -hmm. What are we going to talk about today with Benjamin Harrison? Mm, his presidency. Yep, his presidency. And then what else? His gravesite. His gravesite. Yep, his death and his gravesite. Very good. Yep. So that'll be part two here. Henry, help me out. Uh, we're going to just kind of jump right in. This is, like I said, our next presidential series installment, looking at the 23rd president of the United States. Who's that, Henry? Benjamin Harrison. That's right. And this is part two of our Benjamin Harrison video. So we're going to jump right in. So jumping right in here, Benjamin Harrison, you know, he was supported by special interests with deep pockets and a campaign that targeted key swing states with high numbers of delegates. That's really what it came down to uh, when he ran for president. You know, Harrison, as we said, was the grandson of former President William Henry Harrison. He certainly did not become the 23rd president based on his personal charisma. Um, there's actually, there is a statement that was made about Benjamin Harrison that an empty carriage rolled up and Benjamin Harrison got out. So, <laughs> kind of tells you, Harrison, you know... Benjamin Harrison was not the kind of guy you wanted to be trapped on a desert island with. He was formal. He was rigid. He did not have many friends. In fact, he had the nickname, the human iceberg. Yeah. yeah he, he, was, he, was, he was kind of a cold guy. Rigid. Not exactly overly friendly. You know, Benjamin Harrison, he became little more than a rubber stamp for Congress. Uh, you know, when he was in office, that's really what it was. Um, you know, I'll get into that here in a second. You know, one thing too, that, you know, you got to keep in mind about Harrison in that election of 1888, you know, we did touch on this in our Grover Cleveland series, but you know, now that we're talking about Harrison in the election of 1888, Benjamin Harrison actually lost the popular vote by 90,000 votes, but he won in the electoral college by a margin of 233 to 168, you know, giving him the office of uh, president. Um, Pretty crazy stuff. He, um, it, it's just kind of, it's just nuts that he just, it, just, some of the stuff is just crazy when it comes to Harrison. Uh, you know, the, the whole family tree, of course, like we said, you know, how he became president in between a guy who did two non consecutive terms, just all this stuff. It, pretty interesting stuff. You know, he really, I mean, he was, like I said, he had returned to his law practice earlier. He ran for the presidency in 1888, and he really was a dark horse candidate. He ended up winning uh, the party's nomination when the delegates of the Republican National Convention could not even agree on the two front runners. You know, the, as I just said, the election was very close. It was almost completely divided between North and South. Benjamin Harrison won virtually every Northern state, and Grover Cleveland, the incumbent at the time, he won every Southern state. So Cleveland actually won the popular vote, like I just said. Harrison won by, you know, comfortable margin in, in the electoral uh, college. Um, it's just, it's, it's pretty interesting. I'm going to read you something here, too, about uh, his road to the White House. Um, you know, we know, of course, from 1881 to 1887, he was a representative in Indiana in the U.S. Senate. He argued for the rights of homesteaders and Native Americans against the expanding railroad industry and campaigning for generous pensions for Civil War veterans, among many other issues. Uh, he was a highly principled and devoutly religious man. Um, he broke with the Republican Party to oppose the Chinese Exclusion Act, as I had stated earlier in part one. Um, he, um, he, he just, he wasn't overly a bad person. He just uh, didn't really have much personality go for him. Um, you know, of course, he, in 1888, with the, uh, the presidential election, Rather than traveling around the country during the campaign, Benjamin Harrison gave numerous speeches to delegations that visited him uh, in Indianapolis. It was kind of an early example of the so-called front porch campaigning in a controversial general election, of course. Um, he did just, you know, narrowly beat uh, Cleveland, even though he, you know, did get, lose the popular vote. 
So, okay, here we go. Let's let's look into some more things. Like I said earlier, he just kind of became a little... He was, he, was, he was a rubber stamp for Congress. That's what, what he was. Uh, Congress was more than eager to take the reins of a country with a huge surplus at the time. Uh, it, it's the beginning of the time when the House of Representatives became a lawmaking machine. The Republicans are able to expand dramatically the Civil War pensions... This results in a billion dollars being paid out to the veterans. Billion dollars. Uh, it was actually known as the Billion Dollar Congress. Um, during his administration, Congress appropriated $1 billion in annual spending for the very first time. And that's why it became known as the Billion Dollar Congress. And when this was actually pointed out to Speaker Reed, he just shrugged his shoulders and he said, well, it's a billion dollar country. So, the uh, the legislature became known as the Billion Dollar Congress. You know, but the 55-year-old Harrison, he seemed to have little interest in governing. He was working until noon and sneaking out of Washington to go hunting as often as possible. Um, a cartoonist, in 1888, he drew Benjamin Harrison under a hat much too big for him. And over the course of the presidency, that hat got bigger and bigger. And Harrison himself got smaller and smaller and smaller until finally on election day when he was defeated for re-election, there's actually a picture of Uncle Sam saying, where is he? So yeah, uh, you know, he, he just wasn't an overly popular guy or popular president, so to speak. As I said, he kind of had ice in his veins. He was known as the human iceberg. Uh, he was very often very formal and stiff when dealing with people. Um, just just who he was. Um, so well, let me see what else I could tell you about his uh, presidency. So about his domestic and foreign policy. During Harrison's term in the White House, the lingering effects of an economic depression led to calls for more expansive federal legislation. A longtime protectionist, Harrison supported the passage of the McKinley Tariff Act of 1890 backed by the Ohio congressman and future president, William McKinley. For the first time in peacetime, Congress appropriated a billion dollars during Harrison's administration, angering many Americans who saw the president and his fellow Republicans as too supportive of wealthy interests. On the other hand, Harrison lent his support to the Sherman Silver Purchase Act, which required the government to purchase 4.5 million ounces of silver per month and bowed to the pressure of reformers by signing into law the Sherman Antitrust Act designed to prohibit industrial combinations or trusts. Ohio Senator John Sherman sponsored both acts. Benjamin Harrison also continued his support of veterans benefits as well as his advocacy of forest conservation and the expansion of the U.S. Navy. So some interesting things there that uh, he did. In the foreign policy arena, Benjamin Harrison's administration, including the president and the secretary of state, James G. Blaine, displayed a growing American influence in world affairs. The first international conference of American states, later the Pan-American Union, took place in Washington, D.C. in late 1889. In addition, Harrison's State Department successfully negotiated with Germany and Great Britain to set terms for an American protectorate in the Samoan Islands and opposed Britain and Canada in order to prevent the overharvesting of seals in the Bering Sea. Harrison was unsuccessful, however, in his attempts to convince Congress to back the construction of a canal in Nicaragua, as well as in his efforts to annex Hawaii in 1893. So, interestingly enough there. Um... In 1892, uh, with the U.S. economy flattening, uh, faltering, I should say, Harrison ran for the re-election. He was pitted against the former president, Grover Cleveland, but this time, Cleveland won by a comfortable margin in both the popular and electoral votes. Just a few weeks before the election, Benjamin Harrison's wife died of tuberculosis, and his daughter took over the official responsibilities of the First Lady for the remainder of his term the last time that a non-spouse served as the U.S. First Lady. So interestingly enough, wife died and his, 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 uh, his daughter took over. And that's the last time that ever happened. 
Um, just to give you some other really kind of interesting things, as I touched on in our opening, Benjamin Harrison was the last president who actually had a full beard. Full beard. Uh, he's the last one to have it. So we need another one, right? We needed a, you know, I had my scruffy uh, looking beard, um, you know, not too long ago. I think I might actually be growing it back. I uh, shaved it off for my uh, father's funeral and such, but um, we need another one, right? We need another president with a full beard. Uh, Benjamin Harrison, he actually had electricity installed into the White House. This is kind of a cool thing. Um, Harrison was the very first president to use electricity in the White House it was installed by Edison General Electric Company. However, Benjamin Harrison and his wife would not touch the light switches for fear of being electrocuted and often went to bed with the lights left on. Um, pretty interesting stuff there. As I said, he wasn't known for being very friendly or warm. Um, he he kind of had a, a, a talent for resolving petty disputes, uh, probably due to his kind of cold and... Just very, you know, matter-of-fact manner. Um, Benjamin Harrison, he actually became the centennial president in 1889. Uh, so that's a little fun fact about him. He, uh, Benjamin Harrison, as I just touched on about kind of his presidency and his policies, he favored tariffs in his economic policy. Um, you know, he did save our forests. He was definitely into the conservation of U.S. forests. So that is one thing that he was really, really uh, good about, uh, con conserving U.S. forests. And he also spoke up for civil rights. Uh, you know, that's another very good thing um, that he uh, did and was involved in. Of course, his uh, spouse, Caroline Scott, she died in 1892, uh, as I said, just touched on. Um this is a really cool thing. Okay. First, what I'm going to tell you about is... Um, do, do, do. Here we go. Well, let me just see here. Okay. What I want to tell you about first is a little cool thing here. Harrison shuffling the deck. On November 2nd of 1889, President Benjamin Harrison signed the proclamations admitting North and South Dakota to the Union. Due to a rivalry which existed between the two states... Benjamin Harrison ordered the papers to be shuffled and for the names to be hidden from him while signing so there would be no argument over which he signed first. We don't actually know which one was signed first because it was never recorded. However, since North Dakota is before South Dakota alphabetically, its proclamation was printed first in the statutes at large. Thus, North Dakota has always been considered the 39th state. I thought that was kind of cool. Kind of a cool little story how he signed in North and South Dakota. There was such a rivalry between the two states that he shuffled the papers so nobody knew which actually became a state first. thought that was pretty cool. Um, as I just touched on a few minutes ago about his uh, re-election bid, he was the first president to ever lose to a former president. He defeated the incumbent Grover Cleveland in 1888, but however, in his bid for re-election in 1892... He was Harrison was defeated by Cleveland, making it the only time an incumbent president was defeated by a former president. The election of 1892 also gave us another first. Of course, as we know, it was the first time no candidate campaigned in a presidential election. Neither Benjamin Harrison nor Grover Cleveland actively campaigned, relying on surrogates instead. So interesting, that's another little interesting fact about the election of 1892. Neither of them campaigned. Thought that was pretty pretty darn interesting. Um, here's a really cool thing. So Harrison was a really big talker. He actually once, over a period of 30 days, Benjamin Harrison made 140 completely different speeches. So the man liked to talk. But here's the really cool thing about him lo loving to talk. Benjamin Harrison was the very first president in U.S. history whose voice exists on an audio recording. There's a 36-second clip of Harrison reading from one of his speeches. Harrison was also the first president to install electricity, as I said, in the White House. Um, yeah, so he was the first president to ever have his voice preserved. Um, it was recorded on a wax phonograph cylinder. Pretty interesting stuff. A wax phonograph cylinder 
In 1889, a 36-second speech clip was recorded of Benjamin Harrison's voice. It's the first time in the history of our country that this happened, where we got a president's voice on audio recording. And this is that audio recording. As president of the United States, I was president of the third and American Congress in Washington, D.C. Believe that with God's help, our two countries shall continue to live side by side in peace and prosperity. Benjamin Harrison. Now, how cool is that? I don't know. I find that really cool. Even though Benjamin Harrison didn't, he's not really notable for uh, much that he did in his presidency. Uh, I thought that was really cool. And it sounded like, didn't it sound like somebody that was like uh, trying to rehearse a speech or recite a speech or do something like that, but they had their cell phone in their pocket and they didn't know that it was recording? That's what it sounded like to me, you know, like somebody that's butt dialing you type thing. Um, it, It was pretty interesting. I thought that was cool. So as I said, Harrison's uh, you know first wife died uh, shortly before um, his presidency ended, uh, and then in 1896, Benjamin Harrison married again to a woman who was not only 25 years younger than him, but who was actually his own niece by marriage. Yeah, Mary Dimmick was the daughter of his deceased wife's sister, meaning she was not a blood relation to Harrison, but was a first cousin to Harrison's children. His children refused to attend the wedding, and the union caused an estrangement between Benjamin Harrison and his daughter, and they never spoke again. Benjamin Harrison contracted pneumonia. I'll get into that about his death. But isn't that crazy? He actually married his own niece by marriage, and it caused such strife that his own children didn't like it, and especially his daughter. She never spoke to him again. Um... You know, kind of sad, but pretty crazy. So, uh, you know, let's just touch on real quick Benjamin Harrison's post-presidency career. Of course, as I said, up for re-election in 1892, Harrison struggled to overcome growing populist discontent, including a number of labor strikes. In the general election, he faced Grover Cleveland again, along with a third-party challenge from the populist, or People's Party. The revelation that Caroline Harrison was seriously ill led to modest campaign efforts by both men and caused Harrison to limit his appearances in key swing states, contributing to the margin of his defeat. As I said, both him and Cleveland did not go out there and campaign during this election. Caroline died of tuberculosis in late October, and two weeks later, Benjamin Harrison lost to Grover Cleveland by an electoral vote of 145 to 277, the most decisive victory in 20 years. So then after leaving the White House, Benjamin Harrison returned to Indianapolis and to his law practice. And at the age of 62, he married that Mary Lord Dimmick, his late wife's niece and caretaker. They actually did have one child together. And in 1898, Benjamin Harrison served as leading counsel for Venezuela in the arbitration of its boundary dispute with Great Britain. After spending almost a decade as a respected elder statesman and acclaimed public speaker, now we're going to get into when Benjamin Harrison finally died. And that was in, I believe it was 1901 to be exact. Of course, I'm going to be reading uh, from the book and excerpts from The President is Dead by Louis Pacone. Wonderful book. I show it all the time on the screen. I really encourage you. I've had at least two or three of my subscribers reach out to me to tell me that they bought the book, The President is Dead, based on my recommendation and my uh, you know, advice. And they love it. Every person that has done it and bought it has reached out to me and said, awesome. Thank you for the suggestion. So go do yourselves a favor. Buy the book. It's awesome. So I'm going to read now from that about Benjamin Harrison and his death. Okay, here we go. At the age of 67 and eight years out of office, Benjamin Harrison was in good health and looked forward to many more years as a private citizen. But in early March of 1901, Benjamin Harrison fell ill 
and a single illness begat a quick downfall. He had only recently recovered from a minor cold when on Thursday, March 7th, after break breakfast, Benjamin Harrison cried out sharply for his wife. She rushed to him and found him in distress. He had experienced a severe chill and struck by how suddenly the illness came on, said, This could not have been more sudden if someone had hit me over the head with a hammer. A doctor was called to the house. The next day, Harrison suffered from severe nerve pain. Neural, uh, I believe it's neural, neuralgia. Neuralgia? It's nerve pain. And he was diagnosed with pneumonia. Letters arrived from across the country with unsolicited medical advice. Um, and on Mar so now on March 12th, Benjamin Harrison lay in the master bedroom on the second floor of his home in a massive hand-carved bed drifting in and out of consciousness. His four-year-old daughter Elizabeth made him a small apple pie, but Harrison could only muster a smile in response. In his delirium, most of his words he uttered were unintelligible, but those present were able to make out my lungs and doctor. He last spoke when he asked his wife, are the doctors here? Afterward, he slipped into unconsciousness. The next day, doctors administered oxygen until about 4 p.m., at which time, according to the Indianapolis Journal, came the unmistakable signs that the air cells could no longer receive the fluid and the cap was withdrawn from the mouth. Doctors summoned Harrison's friends and family to his bedside. His wife, Mary, took his right hand. <clears throat> no, no. Oh, yep. His wife, Mary, took his right hand as his physician, Dr. Henry Jameson, held his left and monitored his pulse. Also, there were Attorney General William Henry Harrison Miller of Indianapolis and his son, Samuel Miller. Harrison's good friend and pastor of the First Presbyterian Church, Reverend M.L. Haynes, Frank Tibbet, Dr. F. O. Dorsey, Sergeant in Arms of the United States Senate, Daniel M. Ransdell, Clifford Arick, two nurses, Miss Ella Keene and Miss Suzanne Paris, his aunt, and his two sisters, Elizabeth Eaton and Anna Sims Morris. Sadly, none of his children were with him at his final moment. His two older children were on their way to Indianapolis and young Elizabeth had been taken from the room as death approached. At 4.45 p.m. on March 13th of 1901, Dr. Jameson could no longer feel a pulse. Benjamin Harrison was dead. The Baltimore Morning Herald reported his death was marked by a single gasp for breath as life departed from the body of the great statesman. A silence fell over the room, broken only when Reverend Haynes said a prayer. President William McKinley issued a proclamation for flags on public buildings to fly at half mass for 30 days. <clears throat> so now we will uh, talk about, obviously, there was funeral involved, everything that goes along with, you know, all these things. Um, it, it, it was it was on Sunday, March 17th, so uh, about five days afterwards or so. Uh, four days afterwards, about 150 people were at the home um, of Benjamin Harrison. And at 1 p.m., uh, President McKinley arrived along with the Indiana Governor Winfield Taylor Durbin. A short, a short service uh, began as Reverend Haynes read from the scripture and spoke briefly about the life of the deceased. Um, yeah, so, I mean, people gathered outside the home. The procession eventually moved from the home and it arrived at the First Presbyterian Church on Pennsylvania Street. Uh, this is obviously in Indianapolis, Indiana. So, um, pretty interesting stuff. And of course, it, he is interred and buried at the Crown Hill Cemetery in Indianapolis, Indiana. Um, it's There's not much to it. It's a pretty uh, basic uh, granite tombstone. Um, as a matter of fact, I'll read you about that right now as you've probably seen some pictures of the gravesite and uh, also of other things. I'll read you about, this is uh, some uh, the original picture, what it looked like in 1904, the, the grave. The 10-foot-tall granite tombstone was already in place, selected by Harrison himself 
after the death of his first wife, Caroline Scott, in 1892. At the time of the president's death, it only bore the name Harrison, and it was later inscribed with Benjamin Harrison, August 20th of 1833 to March 13th of 1901, lawyer and publicist, Colonel, 70th Regiment, Indiana Volunteer War, 1861-1865, Breveted Brigadier General, 1865, U.S. Senator, 1881-1887, President, 1889-1893, Statesman, yet friend to truth, of soul sincere, in action faithful, and in honor clear. While it's not as uh, large and imposing as other presidential graves, especially for those presidents born in Ohio, the Sunday Vindicator praised the memorial when it wrote, the very simplicity of the monument and the epitaph are the strongest possible tributes to the sterling character of the man who the grave marks. Um, now also, before I show you more photos of the grave, of course, I visited there. Um, I also wanted to show you the, uh, the death site, of course, where he died. Um, in 1868, Harrison purchased a double lot on North Delaware Street on the outskirts of Indianapolis. Uh, and there was, in the early 1870s, he had an enormous 10,000 square foot, two and a half story brick home uh, built. And this is the house that he died at. Um, and you'll see it here. I did not visit this house. This is Benjamin Harrison's beautiful old home in Indianapolis. I did not go see his home. These are stock photos that I, you know, found online and, and such. But it is a really cool, beautiful, old-looking uh, home. And this is where he died. Um, he did die here um, on March 13th of 1901. Uh, so this is where he, he was sick and he was laying in that big, huge bed. And that's where it all took place. And of course, um, then, of course, like I told you, the, the funeral church was... First Presbyterian Church there in Indianapolis. And then now to close this out, the Crown Hill Cemetery. The Crown Hill Cemetery uh, is in Indianapolis, Indiana. Uh, there's a few uh, notable people uh, buried there. Um, so, you know, in case you want to go stop by there and take a look. Um, pretty cool, though. Uh, pretty cool place. Nice cemetery. It's a big cemetery. Very huge cemetery. Uh, but the pictures you're seeing here are... Benjamin Harrison's grave there in the Crown Hill Cemetery in Indianapolis, Indiana. I did visit here, obviously, last year during uh, 2020. Um, again, not much to it. it you know, that newspaper uh, that depicted it as, you know, the simplicity of it. It's very true. It's very simplistic. It's just kind of a, you know, tall, big uh, granite stone and got some markings on it. Got some uh, epitaphs and, and that's about it. There's not much to it. Uh, there's not much, I, I would use the word, there's not much grandeur to it. Uh, pretty basic. But again, Crown Hill Cemetery is a really cool cemetery. It's huge. Uh, you could definitely spend a day looking up some historical things and people in there. Um, and then, of course, you could go see the 23rd president of the United States while you're there, Benjamin Harrison. So um, that was it. You know, that, that was pretty much it for Benjamin Harrison. So, yeah, that was kind of it for Benjamin Harrison, uh, as I said. You know, that was the life, the legacy, presidency, his death, uh, you know, his, where he died. And then, of course, finally, his what? His gravesite. That's right, his gravesite. That's right, Henry. So uh, I hope you liked this look at our 23rd president of the United States, Benjamin Harrison. And, uh, of course, next week, no, we will not be doing the 24th president because we already did that with the Grover Cleveland video. We will be doing the and taking 25th. a look. That's right. We'll be taking a look at the 25th president of the United Who States, William McKinley, the third president to ever be assassinated. Third? Yeah. Who was first to be assassinated? Mm. The very first one to be shot. Abraham? Abraham Lincoln. Who was the second? Uh, 21st? Nope, the 20th. Mm, I don't know. Fat orange cat. Uh, Grover Cleveland. No, Grover Cleveland's jersey. Fat Orange Cat. James Go James Garfield. There you go. And William McKinley's the third one to be assassinated. So we'll get into all that next week when we take a look at William McKinley. So thanks for everything, guys. Thanks for the support. Bye. Thanks for the likes. Thanks for everything. We Bye. love you guys. And we really appreciate the support. 
keep the comments and questions coming. Yes. Keep the subscribes coming. We, we love it. That's right. We love it. it. So we will see you next yes. week. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye.